Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today, this evening, to the talk of behind the scenes of writing a cookbook memoir. My journey in discovering my roots, family, my food in Singapore by author Sharon Wee. Hello everyone, thank you for coming this evening. I hope that you've walked around and taken a look at some of the displays and the books. I was very impressed. And before I start, I'd like to read something that I saw uh, this afternoon. It's by Italo Calvino. It's called The Written World and the Unwritten World. And it's translated by Anne Goldstein. It was at the Italian booth. Books are made to be many. A single book has meaning only in that it's next to other books, in that it follows and precedes other books. So it has been ever since books were papyrus scrolls lined up on the shelves of libraries, vertical cylinders arrayed like organ pipes, each with its voice, serious or delicate, bold or melancholy. So today I'm going to talk about growing up in a Nonia kitchen. It's a book that I first launched in 2012. And I like to think that it stood the test of time, it stands the test of time, because earlier this year, we launched its 10th anniversary edition. The book is a biography of my mother's life, and it's also an autobiography of my life, my childhood in the 70s and 80s. It's a history of Singapore. It's a cookbook of um, the compilation of my mom's recipes, and it's a cultural understanding of the Peranakans. And with regards to the history of Singapore, it's from the 1900s. Okay. Now, I could talk about just how I came about writing a cookbook, compiling the recipes, translating them, but I want to zero in also on the memoir portion of my book. It's my journey in discovering my roots, my family, my food in Singapore. And the other thing also is, is to celebrate the excellent quality of books published in Singapore, written by Singaporean authors, those that have come before me. And it's really through them, their books, that I actually manage to create mine. Now, if you look at this slide, um, this is from the 1970s, and this is the East Coast of Singapore. Now, when I was growing up in the East, um, there was a lot of reclamation going on to build and extend the shoreline. And the white section here, actually, if you've been to Singapore, is actually the expressway that leads from the airport to the city center. A lot of demolition happened in the 70s um, to make way for new buildings, for expressways, um, new apartment blocks. And um, where I grew up in the east is also a lot of um, where my book is based. The demolition continued. The um, up here is Raffles Place, considered like the Wall Street of Singapore. And um, now you see a lot of gleaming tall skyscrapers. The building on the left was our department store, Robinson's. This photograph here on the right is actually Arab Street. And thankfully, if you go to Arab Street, which is in the Kampong Glam area, um, near Raffles Hotel, you actually still see the, these shop houses. 
Because there came a point in time when the Singapore government realized that we needed to conserve our heritage and preserve our history for future generations to understand where we came from and who we are. And what that resulted was um, building new museums, conserving old buildings like these, and also building up the archives. So with all that, my love for history, therefore, um, helped me define this cookbook that eventually became a memoir. What has Frankfurt got to do with this? Well, when I was 11 in 1981, I was bewitched by the royal wedding of Prince Charles to Lady Diana Spencer. And I developed this hobby of studying Europe's royal families. And this is actually a painting in Buckingham Palace of Queen Victoria with her German husband, Prince Albert. And these are the five, uh, the, the oldest five children of, out of nine. And the picture in the middle, the person in the middle is actually Princess Alice of Hesse. And that's where Frankfurt is based in, right? It's in Hesse. And she actually married the prince here. She's also, she was also the mother of the last Tsarina of Russia. And she's the ancestress of King Charles III through his father, Prince Philip. So as a child, I got really kind of keen on family history. I read up a lot of biographies. I read a lot of, um, about the royal families. And by the time the 2021 lockdown came about, I was in London. I was a little bit bored. I was stuck there. And I got a little bit sophisticated. I looked through the website and I created this very complex family tree connecting the Danish, the Swedish, the Russians, the German royals, and the British royal family. So my love for history has always been there since I was young. And that gave me some idea of what I was going to do with my book. It all starts with my mother. This is a wedding photo of my mother and father from January 1948. She was 17, he was 21, and they um, had just met one time before this at a Chinese restaurant. The two families had come together, they saw each other from a distance, the stars were aligned, and the families decided, yes, they can get married. And they were married for more than 50 years. This is what you would call the matchmaking photograph. Um, and she was about 16 at this point. Now, towards the end of her life, at the age of 71, my father told me that my mother um, had had a pretty tough life. She was born in a well-to-do family. She had personal chefs growing up, but she also had a rather ill mother who eventually died before she was married. And so um, she was struggling in the sense that she was not of that generation of, I mean, she was in that generation of women, but she was unusual in the sense that she did not grow up learning how to cook. On top of that, because she was born in, a 19, in 1930, um, she had her education disrupted during World War II, as well as the fact that her father felt that as a girl, she did not really need to finish her studies. So she only studied for the first five years of school, and she studied English and maths, and her mathematics skills actually helped her eventually when she cooked for us and also when she had to do large scale um, cooking. So I wanted to really understand this kind of generation and culture that she had grown up in. And after she passed away, 
I started to talk to my female relatives, my grand aunts and my aunt. This is a photograph of my grand aunts. I spoke to this one, second from right, and this is my mother's sister. And I also interviewed another sister of hers. And this is another photograph of what the women might have looked like in 1964. They would have been dressed like what I'm wearing. This is a grand aunt who is dancing with my father. I wanted to understand who the Peranakan um, community was because I had grown up in it. Now, just to define what Pranakan means, it actually stems from the word anak, which means child in Malay. So it's basically implying that you're a child of the local land. And in my case, I'm a Chinese Pranakan. Now, the Chinese Pranakans are descended from Chinese settlers who came as early as the 1500s from the southern coast of China, which is on the top left. And they came down south to Southeast Asia to seek their fortune. And they had um, assets that they um, acquired. And eventually, they began to marry the local women of the land. Now, these women were actually um, rather influential in the sense that they had connections, they knew the lay of the land, and they could help these traders look after their property when these traders went back to China. They actually had to wait for the monsoon winds to clear before they could make their way back. And over time, this community actually um, evolved. They um, had offspring, the offspring actually um, acquired their father's names and also their father's traditions, but they took on their mother's language as well as the attire. And there was a fusion culture that came about where they commissioned architecture, their own porcelain, their jewelry, but most famous of all, is their cuisine. So we are known for our cuisine in the sense that the women use the local ingredients of the land, but they also incorporated the ingredients that these forefathers loved from China. And so you see, we have spring rolls. You'll find that in Taiwan as well. Um, and we also created crispy cups to contain these, uh, the, the same filling. There's also laksa, which includes chili paste, as well as coconut milk and dried shrimp. Now, as I mentioned, the women became rather famous for this kind of cuisine. It was considered elaborate, time consuming, pretty much done by ladies of leisure. That's not really the case. It's actually okay. You can manage with the cooking. Now, this is um, the cuisine that you would see. Um, what happened is that the women were basically expected to stay at home, learn to cook, care for the family, sometimes learn to sew, learn to do bead, uh, beaded embroidery. And um, what happened was that in the late 1800s, 1900s, there was a colonial secretary of education who decided that these girls were going to be the future matriarchs, and they were kind of small-minded, and it was a concern for him that they were going to propagate this ignorant thought to future generations. Here over here, would be the first batch of what they call Queen's Scholars. And they were sent abroad for university. One came back, became a doctor, and the other one came back and became a lawyer. 
and they are Puranakans. They just felt, you know what? We need to start formal education for our girls. I wrote about that in an essay in the latest edition. And so they formalized the education by starting up a school. The school would be for the Pranakan girls. As you can see, they have the same outfit that the women would have worn in that time. And these girls eventually went on to have um, better education, which eventually in our day and age would involve going to high school, going to university. Now, by the time I was a beneficiary of this education, I had the tools to learn and also to explore my background. And I started to do research on the Pranakans. This is a book published in Singapore by two Singaporean authors. And this is a depiction of a, uh, another uh, wedding um, earlier in the century. She must have been about 16, he might have been 17 or even younger. And to this day, I'm always wondering if the groom got married and then eventually he went back to school the very next day after his wedding. But in 1980, sorry, in 1989, I did this project in school, in university, exploring my Pranakan heritage. My anthropology professor was rather impressed. He thought it was an excellent piece. He gave me an A. And he couldn't quite figure out how it actually um, met the question of his project or his, his assignment. He just didn't think that Pranakans were a topic of anthropology, but I beg to differ. Why did I choose this topic? Because I was very fascinated by the architecture. As you can see, these houses still exist. And they're narrow, they're very pastel colored. Narrow because historically, these houses or these properties were taxed according to their frontage. So the narrow it is, the less tax you pay. In my cookbook, I put a photo of this house that my mother grew up in. We also had beautiful jewelry, which also fascinated me. And these were commissioned designs. And there are also um, essays about this in my latest edition. So in coming up with my project and later on with my cookbook, I referred to books that had already been published in Singapore by authors who had done a lot of research and for example, there is a Baba Malay dictionary, which proved to be very, very um, integral in defining the spelling and the words and the definitions for the Baba Malay language. Um, there is also this book here, The Babas by Felix Chia. It's probably 40 years old. Um, and it's a very interesting book in the sense that it was probably one of the first to talk about who we actually are. A Baba wedding depicts the 12 nights of a wedding. And the 12th, night, the 12th day culminates in the serving of nasi lama, which is coconut rice served with different side dishes. And I was also interested in the beadwork and the embroidery, as well as the beaded shoes. And in the beaded shoes, they even have instructions on how to create these shoes. Bejeweled is a book that is more recent, but it's a very beautiful book that explains the different types of jewelry that the Pranakans had. With the research, that also entailed visiting museums. In my undergrad days, I went to the National Museum. 
By the time I came back and did my cookbook, I researched at the Pranaka Museum, and these are actually my children. I would bring them with me. We went several times. And um, I also learned a bit about the porcelain, the details. These were actually owned by one of my ancestors. To hone my writing skills, I helped to write in the Pranakan um, magazine. It's a fabulous magazine produced by the Pranakan Association. I read every issue from cover to cover, and I picked up facts that I could then apply to what I was working on. This book, 100 Years History of the Chinese in Singapore, was actually written more than 100 years ago by one of those scholars that I had put in the slide earlier. And this book is actually produced by the Pranakan Museum. So in terms of the quality of books that we had, they turned out to be really, really helpful in giving me a lot of information. Now, I had already gained a lot of data for the product and culture at large, but I also needed to funnel it down to my mother's story. This is a photograph of my mother's family. The two seated are my great-grandparents with a son and a son-in-law. When I was growing up, my mother would always talk a lot about her family. And hopefully I retain quite a bit of it. So remember I was telling you I love family trees. In my teenage years, I actually jotted them down and I created this rather simple family tree. But it all came to life when I started seeing names on road signs and that there were similarities with the names that she had quoted to me. So this fascination and this interest just continued for me. Over time, the books just got better and better. So there was always a constant flow of books and the cookbooks were also very good. And so I continued to read. There is a book on gold jewelry, there's one on Sarang Kabaya, there's one on the Straits Chinese. So it's rich fodder. I started to research newspaper articles, and this is one of a relative within my mom's family. And this photograph, a little bit blurry, is actually one that was in the museum's publication which I could then identify as images that I could use in my cookbook. So I sought the permission from the private collector who had been collecting old photographs of Singapore and eventually he donated them to the National Archives and the museum. So with all that research, I managed to um, trace them, connect with them, and apply them in the writing of my book. Now, fortuitously, in the early 2000s, there had been a lot of news about a rather significant cemetery that was partly made way for yet another expressway. And a lot of newspaper articles and website articles came about about the exhumation of some of these graves. So that was actually um, helpful for me in the sense that by reading it, I learned more about the history of my family. And then I literally hugged a gravestone. <laughs> so I actually did walk to the cemetery to do yet another exploration of my ancestors. Now we go on to the food. 
When my mother was married at 17, she did not know how to cook. And that was quite the struggle because she married into a family where she, as the eldest daughter-in-law, had to cook for her husband, his parents, his two brothers, his aunts, his uncles. It was a really large extended family. Thankfully, she learned to cook by, uh, by being taught by his blind grandmother. Now, she had to commit all the recipes mentally. And as she got older, she got some of us to write them down. That included helpers, daughters, and also my father. And by the time I got to do this cooking, I learned her pranakan dishes, as well as some of these um, lessons that she had attended at community centers, learning from the star chefs of that era. In my cookbook here, this is what we would have eaten for Chinese New Year. These are the celebration dishes, and it's called the Tok Panjang. Now, when I thought of writing a cookbook, I was very aware that there were already uh, well-published, uh, well, well-received Pranakan cookbooks. Um, some of them were even written by my, friend, uh, my mother's friends. And I spoke to those in the publishing industry, I spoke to editors, and um, I was encouraged to associate my recipes with how my family actually ate those dishes. And so this photograph, I like to think, which is in my book, um, I like to think of it as encapsulating the emotions within my family. My mom is celebrating her birthday, but if you look at the smiles and the laughter and the body language, um, it's, it's a testament of the joy that food brings to a family. And that's why this title is called A Family's Food Memories of Singapore. Nonetheless, I still went back to the museum to learn about the significance of the Tok Panjang, how the plates are positioned, what dishes go on which dish, which plates. And I applied that in describing what a Tok Panjang would be like. And then I had to put the recipes together. So one of the things that happened was that um, my mom had so many recipes, and some of them were actually written in Malay. And some of the measurements were in old measurements such as Katis and Tahils. I had to convert them. It took about 10 years to research them. And again, I went and looked at Singapore's published books regarding herbs and spices. I referenced other cookbooks to see how recipes and methodology were done um, in order to write up the recipes for others to use. So we come to the outcome. By 2023 or 2022, the world had changed quite a bit from when I first published this book in 2012. First of all, recipes needed to be refreshed because ingredients might have changed over time. And with the advent of bigger and better books, instructions are better written. So I felt compelled to test the recipes all over again. But by then, I had this daughter who's old enough to help me and my niece. And there was also a bigger global awareness and curiosity about who the Puranakans were or are. So I invited essayists to contribute. I had someone to explain the genetic history of the Puranakans. I also had those 
who had the expertise in jewelry or porcelain or the language to help write. And I was also cognizant of the fact that in this day and age, we understand that other cultures influence, or rather that cultures influence one another. Now, Keir Johari spoke at the Frankfurt Book Fair last year. And his book, The Food of Singapore Malays, is a seminal work. And I asked him to help me write an excerpt from his book explaining the influence of the Malay cuisine on Peranakan cuisine. Now, another fun outcome was that because I had documented my mother's family, I got in touch with long-lost relatives. We're all descended from the same guy, the one in the top hat. Um, and the person in blue was actually Singapore's ambassador to Germany. So with the 2023 edition, I've managed to get contributions to help explain my culture better and to sort of explain this family that I come from as well as the food that I eat. And because of this heightened awareness around the world, zeroing in on us, I like to think that it's attributed to the fact that there are so many good books in our region that gives a light, a greater light, sheds a greater light on who the Pranakans are, to the point that media outside of the region have contacted us or reached out to learn more about our cuisine. This was written by the New York Times about the cultural identity of the Pranakans through its food. So in summary, I like to say that um, thanks to the books available in Singapore, the research that I could conduct, um, it helped complement the interest in history that I've had since I was young to come up with um, this book that was really written out of love um, to commemorate my mother's life. And I'm gonna end with a video of the work that we did in coming up with the 2023 edition. Thank you.